now we are theoretically live, but we should tell the world that they should go to weirdthings.com slash live, correct? Uh, just weirdthings.com. Oh, yep. Yeah. All right. Live now to record the Weird Things podcast with uh, at Andrew Main and at Justin R. Young. HTTP colon slash slash a weird things dot com. There we go. Boom. Does anyone know if it's working? What's up, kiddo? Uh, let me see your tweet. Yeah, don't look into that. No. Let's do it on here. Oh, retweet your tweet. Yeah, looks like you were live on yeah. Justin.tv. Now we know that it's true. That we're live. Girl, you know it's true. Girl, you know it's true. You know, ooh, I expected ooh, that stuff to come ooh. back in a big way, but I guess the fakeness still stings everyone, so they never did. Like, like there's something, I don't know, like five years after they went out that I would listen to, to those songs, and it was like they were so hilariously over the top that I loved them all of a sudden. And it's like you realize like they're well-produced, and it's like the only problem is that they were just very blatantly exposed as a lie. <laughs> there is that. Uh, I just like that, that that period of the 80s where, or 90s rather, where it was just clothing-wise, fashion, culture. It just somehow outdid the 70s in some ways with colors and stuff. Yeah. You know, like look at, you know, Color Me Bad, you know, the outfits. And, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> the, the trend of the, the rainbow leather jacket. Yeah. And the sweaters and... There's definitely, I mean, like that's, it's, it's something that was so of that era that I don't know if like, you know, like if it comes back, it is an accent as opposed to something that you would wear kind of regularly, which is what it was viewed as then. Uh, did I ever tell you about like, uh, you know, speaking of color me bad there, I went to a, I think about this all the time and I don't know why. But uh, uh, we were at a water park, and uh, this big, tough-looking Hispanic guy had a neck tattoo. Where if you saw, you know, where it said "John G. raped and killed my wife," you know, on on Memento. Only it was in this fancy-ass script, and it said, "I want to sex you up." <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and it was like shortly after, you know, like 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 as that was still popular, it was clearly a new tattoo. And I remember thinking, like, like what is a uh, uh, what is that going to be like? And then it, at the time I remember thinking like, well, that's commitment to the bit. And then like years later, I thought that song is laughably bad. And now he has a tattoo wherever that guy is really going all in on, uh, I want to sex you up. Sexing you up, man. I just, I just kind of a weird moment for me was, uh, you know, Trey Mason, who's a running back at Auburn, you know, mm-hmm. who's an exceptional player. And uh, nominated for uh, high for the Heisman, Heisman Trophy, uh, and they talk about and his father from De La Soul. <laughs> wow! Oh wow! Really? I didn't I didn't know Vincent that. Mason, yeah. So it was just like wow. it's like you know it's like you're, you know like not a player, but you know this guy from this really mellow, cool you know music from the nineties. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that was like you know that was that that whole there was like that whole wave of like like chill hip hop, like PM yeah. Dawn and yep, yep. PM Dawn fan. But like De, De La Soul, uh, continue. I mean, they, they, they were, uh, like a third of the gorillas. Uh, yeah. Because they kept showing up on all this stuff. Like, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Meh. So, so now son, star football player. <laughs> Just, yeah. He's going to go in the first round of the draft too. He was insane. He had like 200 yeah. yards in that, uh, that final. Man, speaking insane. of the draft, I'm sad about the the ultimate summer not happening. The ultimate summer's been canceled, Brian. Yeah, we had two uh like like uh, you could still kind of get away with calling it the ultimate summer until like until we also lost uh, you know, Justice League or whatever. As long as yeah, Batman like Batman Superman. versus Superman going up against the Avengers was really the, the the key there. It was it was the ultimate bloodbath when Star Wars was in there too. Oh but- my god, just insane, right? Uh, 
but yeah, everything's kind of moved. Although a lot of it's to 2016 now. So if it all actually winds up panning out, it still might be pretty big. All right, here, let's go ahead and set levels. All right, this is me talking my mouth, my mouth levels. That's good. You're hitting around 12 and I'm hitting around 12. What about you, Justin? Check, check, check. One, two, three. Yeah, you're right around 12. Actually, I'm going to dial you back just a touch because um, you tend to get a wee bit excitable, Justin. I, I do, know I do, this. I know. Uh, and just uh, just as, as a note, unless there's like catastrophic screw up. Yeah, I, I have uh, re rebooted the router, so uh, we'll keep an eye out if there is. Uh, I guess whenever it happens, like how long until I draw attention to it? How many seconds do I let I mean, it like go? you can draw attention to it as long as you don't say, Justin, note here, 22 minutes, okay. All right. 45 That's fine. seconds. Yep. Got it. All right. We'll uh, just go straight to tape, basically. If we can, you know, unless it's like we drop off and you have to reset or something. Yeah. It's just easier. And, and when, when, when you listen back to it, it's really not all that noticeable and not as noticeable as it is in the moment. I mean, in the moment, it's brutal. All right, Josie, you have to stay off camera. You can only play over on this side. All right, and we are recording. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Yeah, we're back. Two weeks in a row. Back to back Weird Things weeks in your face world and mr <laughs> brian brushwood not not just me but i got an appendage over here come here come here appendage say say hello you got to say something go say For words. Audio, <laughs> oh my god brian is that's, holding what appears to be a young girl and that's the last time i ever do that sorry <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to apologize to all of our headphone listeners <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, you want weird? Do you want to get this right off the bat? So yeah, dude, no. Quit Let's wasting go. my time. Every second you're not telling me weird stuff is a moment I'm not weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> did you enjoy the silence, Brian? I did. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say enjoyed. I, I pensively tolerated did the silence. Did you have to let it linger? That was the, that was the original song. Pensively tolerate the silence. Wait for Brian, words to come. We have... I don't know how to describe it. A potentially universe shattering piece of news. Okay, go on. It could be nothing. It could be something. It would be a great beginning to a story that could potentially lead to our demise. I, All right? I don't this know. This is what I like to call a first class triple a t's right here so, this is a lead-in there's a i remember seeing this once in a i think it was like an alternate superman story um and I, i'm trying to remember the details of it but it basically like, like you know what if what if like superman had landed on like mars or something and it'll put him into like this you know edgar rice burroughs warlord of mars sort of situation and then I think I've seen this before, but the idea of you have your lander sitting on a planet and it's cameras fixed on something and then you see like a shadow of something, a hint of something, not a direct thing, but you're like, what's this shadow? What are we looking at? What's going on here? Right? Because then it's the opens up the idea that we land in, in almost the right place, but maybe not quite what we wanted to see. Okay. So we've got Opportunity Rover on Mars, and it's sitting there, and it's kind of got its camera. It's been there for like 10 years, 10 years. Oh, my God. You're talking about spirit and opportunity opportunity, and, and yeah. spirit is like totally dead at this point, right? But opportunity but, but still— But opportunity still gives us video back. Got it. And, you know, it is just a round-the-clock government employee, not giving up. Place. It's cameras <laughs> fixed there. And so here you are, you're NASA, you're some guy NASA. Every day you sort of check the little feed, like your little security camera footage to see what's up. I'm like, oh yeah, uh, still rock, still Mars. Okay. Day 3,422. No. Yep, still rock, still nothing going oh, okay. on. <laughs> Day 3,538. Still rock, still nothing. Day... 3,540. Where did that come from? 
So just something mm. new shows up in the field? As they describe it, a jelly donut sized rock has appeared in front of the opportunity to rover okay, on Mars. Okay, first of all, that's what does that say about the folks working at NASA with the first thing you compare it to is a jelly donut? Okay, Brian, can we cut them some slack? They've literally watched the background of a computer for the last 10 <laughs> like, years. They, they, they want to get a little sassy with they, their rock description. They, they, I give them a full pass. They, they, they're like, it's, it's about the size of a discus or maybe a shot put, um, uh, maybe two or three tennis balls. It's about no. the size of two rubber duckies, regulation size, <laughs> taped together. <laughs> it's like half so, of an Adidas shoe. So there's this rock. It's back to the mystery rock here. Now, scientists think maybe... Could have been when Opportunity Rover moved, it flipped over the rock and they hadn't noticed it. And they're like, oh, look, we turned that over. It could be left, it could be from a meteoric impact. Oh, like a meteor lands behind it, throws a little bit of debris over it. Mm -hmm. but, and so I guess my guess is they don't have like seismic re uh, readings or anything like that on there. I don't know. Yeah. So. Anyhow, now they're trying to figure out where this thing came from, but there's a rock. There's a rock. What if this rock is like, you know, what if we're dealing with an ant-sized civilization? <laughs> and they're building like a huge monument to their new god, the metal overlord that has come from beyond. Or they're building their own space elevator. <laughs> Just really slowly. They, they yeah. first have to do their Tower of Babel thing. It looks kind of like a mini coliseum. Oh. Could be. There's okay. Oh, what if that battles. is? What if that is? It's like the metal overlord has arrived. It demands <laughs> entertainment. We Sacrifice shall fight to the death him. beneath All right, his now, gaze. All right. So uh, I'm thinking about this in movie form. I'm yeah. just I'm pitching it to you guys. So uh, obviously, the, our main character is uh, the guy who's watching the feed. I'm thinking Ethan Hawke, right? And like he's been watching for years and nope, years. No, nope. no. It's got to be Val Kilmer. You think now, like current fat? Mal yes, Gilmer. exactly. Like for sci-fi channel movie of the week, or do we want to go? Are we going like big? This big is. I'm print. thinking. No, no. You you knock this out as one of those like ten million dollar. You know, opens at like seventy million. Like you know, horror sci-fi. You know, kind of movies that like like the the purge and stuff like that. Like we, we want to do a sci-fi bent on on one of those kind of like. uh very uh, budget thriller okay. kind of movies, right? So you get your Ethan Hawke and he's watching and then all of a sudden it's like, first there's like the little, first there's the rock, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe that's the trailer, like it started with the rock. <laughs> and he's like trying to tell everybody at NASA, like there was not a rock here. And NASA's like, whatever, you're going crazy. It's like to keep your program going. Them. Yeah, uh, exactly. Then, it's all of a sudden, he starts hearing things and it's the civilization talking to him through the, uh, through the Rover. Now, somehow. I, 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 I feel, know. okay. Now I feel like it has to be like a psychic communication or something like something like only he can hear. And it's like, he keeps telling them. And, and then like, there are like, you know, somebody has gone a little crazy in his cubicle. Yes. And or, so or it's, it's well, like, maybe it's like the feed gets jittery. So it's like this thing, but it never records. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Get this image through here, you know, like uh, you know, the uh, Zod thing, people of Earth. You know, it's like, zzz, zzz, zzz. it's like, guys, guys, you see this? Right, right. What's going on? Like, no, it's just, it's just. The, there's a rock there. There's a rock. You know, he's been staring. But, at so, but so, the key is we got to either get the civilization to Earth or him to the civilization, right? Like that's where the story. No, needs to no, go. no, no. I think I think this thing goes to. Uh, Okay, I think the whole first, like, act is this stuff. And then it just snaps to uh, to the story of just one of the individuals. Like, all of a sudden, now it's Gladiator, basically. Wait, wait, I'm wait. Let me, let me give you, Brian, let me give you, like, a, a mid-act thing, that the game changer. Is all right. Finally, they believe him. And yeah. they're like, all right, well, let's take the drill to this rock. He's like, it might be alive. We can't do that. Right, and then and it's, so they drill into the rock, and then like all of a sudden, it's an act of war, and he's got to go to Mars and a crash program to go uh, sue for peace. Uh, uh, oh no, because NASA's like, listen, we drilled the rock. I don't see what the problem is, right? Except, and this is just a naked attempt to ring in a a thinly veiled Elon Musk character into our story. 
It's the private guy who's like, hey, listen, I've seen, cause he's like been posting on some message board, right? Like this Mars research message board yes. that nobody cares about that our Elon Musk character is also reading. And he's like, hey, listen, I'm willing to send you to, like, I understand where you're coming from. I believe your research. I believe that you are on to the fact that we will be destroyed by this micro civilization if we do not go make peace. I'm sending you to Mars in my rocket that I've been secretly building aside from all this stuff that I've been publicly talking about. Uh, yeah, well, and, and and basically, like, my plan was to go retire on Mars. I've made no secret of my plans to retire on Mars. Uh, and you all laughed at me. What you didn't know was I was secretly building uh, uh, Screw You too, the rockets. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's, take a, let's take an interesting detour here because you guys bring up a fascinating point of view thought. We've talked about before. It's very, it's very indulgent for you to at least give us the word fascinating for our point of view. <laughs> no, I like it. So let me hear her going. So we've talked about before one of the biggest threats that we have to face is the possible of a meteor taking us out. You know, yeah, something. Yeah. The asteroid we don't see crashes into us. Imagine you're Elon Musk, all right? And you're thinking, you know, I don't know if I have a whole lot of faith in government to get their act together to save our butts if something like this happens. And you're sitting there at your office at SpaceX. You're looking at your inventory of rocket engines. You're looking at the inventory of rockets. And you're like, you know, I could build a rocket. You know, all I'd need is, you know, if I wanted to put a warhead on or whatever, you know, assuming some conventional way to deflect it would actually work if you got to it early on. And you have a lot of money. You're buying the James Bond, you know, uh, Spy I Love Me car. Or, uh, or the Moonraker uh, package. You know, you're you've got tons of cash, right? Yeah. Do you like pull in a couple of your bright guys? Like, hey, listen, let's have our own scenario where if the asteroid comes, we solve it. Oh my god, dude! Do you think I, I, I? There's some part of me that definitely believes that's already happened. Like somebody said that they're like, I'll allocate, allocate a few thousand dollars. Just come up with some scenarios. Just just draw it out. Give me some plausibilities for uh, because of course like. With asteroids, the sooner you act, the easier yeah. it is to fix. And imagine, think about this. Elon Musk is right now the guy who's kind of running SpaceX and kind of, you know, kind of saving the, the electric car. He has that that stuff in the hangar ready to go. Then he, all is the, he is the one person on the planet right now who could order a launch, could get something on a pad, get it up and running, you know, by himself. Self. Yes. And who could, I mean, like if he did it clandestine enough, right? Is there any, could anybody stop it? Like if he's like, hey, listen, you guys in Congress are dithering about whether or not we're going to blow up the asteroid that might, you know, destroy us in, you know, 20, 30 years or whatever. I'm sending the Elon Musk, like, you know, yeah, y'all heard about moonshots? My moonshots blow up the moon I'm shooting at. And that moon is that asteroid. All right. Now I'm taking aim. Think about this, though. Okay, so so you, you got an asteroid co coming. They're like, this is an extraordinarily close call. We've never had one that had an eighty percent chance of impact before. This is devastating. It's terrifying. The economy is collapsing. Elon Musk says, "I'm going to fix it." And you, they they've got time. They got like you know a few years or whatever. Uh, but he goes, does his thing right, and then something breaks midway. And, uh, and, uh, like, uh, cause, uh, you know, when you have, when you have an asteroid coming, there's a few things you could do. You could do a gravity drive where you just kind of, you know, hover near it to kind of use your gravity to pull it. You have a mass drive where you get on it and you start flinging pieces of the rock off to sort of throw it off course. Uh, you know, of course the sexiest is the whole, you know, blow something up on it, but you don't know what that's going to do. It's unpredictable. He tries one of those and it doesn't quite work. And the end result is that where they had, We'll say a 60 to 80% chance of collision before the mission ends. And now it's like, there is a 100% chance that this is going to slam right into the earth. We need to prepare for, for the dark ages. All of a sudden that same one man who, who made the call and who lifted the rocket, that one single individual is personally responsible for potentially destroying the human race. Yeah, risk reward, Brian. Yeah, Bri I like Brian, how you dwell on, on you the on dark here. side. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, like, do you think? Do you think everyone would sit by with that being a po why, possibility? Why do you hate private enterprise? What? Wait, what? <laughs> why do you hate private enterprise? No, 
Come on, bro. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, like, you're, you're telling me, like, uh, do you think anyone's going to let him? Like, oh, think about it. Okay, so imagine this. I don't think he comes out and necessarily says, hey, guys, I'm going to do this. I think I think they would shut him down before he got a chance. Okay. Oh, yeah. But but if, uh, oh, man, do you think he just up and goes, or do you think he That's announces? That's what I'm saying. That's what we're talking about. Because if he says, hey, I got this, NASA's going to be like, no, you're not. Uh, FAA's going to be like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know? But Next then, thing you know, he's in some unmarked room in, you know, a protectorate of the United States, so he can't put his finger on the button. Oh, so you think they would? They would totally stop him. Uh, oh, yeah. really? dude. But for exactly that reason, you would have the president coming out and saying, or, or a spokesman for the, the uh, uh, you know, world, collection of world governments that would say, you can't have one man take... You know, this is not vigilante space justice. Okay, now, you know? but, but here's the thing. I feel like they would uh, they would say that, but they would let him do it. They, I think they would stand uh -oh. they idly would by. They take over the project. I they think they would want would, to. That, they I, would. Oh, go NASA, ahead. NASA and all that, they're engineers. They'd want to like, well, we need to do this. We need to look at this and check this out. But, know? okay, and yes, all of those things. They will say, we need to check it out. No one man should have this right. You shouldn't do this. Stop, stop what you're doing. But. I think they stand there barking those things so they could be on the record as saying it, knowing oh. that this guy's going to go up for free and waste his time and capital or whatever. I, I think they seize the facilities. I think they, oh, yeah. they pull in armed people there and take over the entire thing. Because, Brian, that long storied history of the government just allowing people to do things completely unfettered without their control and oversight. Oh, no, no, no. Look, there's a number of things that the government just barks and, and shouts like, you shouldn't do that. But knowing that it works out really well for them lets it happen. I mean, that's, Letting a private indiv individual launch his own ballistic missile. I do they, not think would fall under that heading. Well, I mean, but I mean, isn't that what uh, what what SpaceX is doing? I mean, what's the difference with? Uh, I mean, they they go to a NASA facility. They have an FAA approved flight plan. They have NASA assist as far as the telemetry, everything else. Like there, it's it's cooperative. You're doing this with under the I mean, auspices well, well, of the well, government. Well, let me flip this on you guys. You you guys really think they could get away with a secret launch? How I is, think they'd have how to is go that do remotely like possible? Or some other place? They'd have to like, oh yeah, we, it's our new test pad. Uh, yeah, no, I no. I don't think they're going to get away with that without anyone know, knowing there's uh, like, like politically. Okay. If you have an imminent death threat upon you and it's more yeah. likely that it's good to do something than to do nothing. Even if that something is reckless, what you do is you let that something happen, but all the time bark about the side crap. You're, that doesn't really guy, matter. You're the guy that just told us that what if it destroys all life on earth? Well, I mean, but but again, like, what, I mean, you know, what if, what if, what if? So like, you're, you're the, the, I would imagine it play out where the president would bring in his science advisor and to ask him, like, what are the, what's the, and the science advisor's like, well, we got to be in charge of this. Because well, here, it goes Brian, wrong. To, to, go, to go back to the original point, I, 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 my point was not that, like, well, of course, he would just, like, in the same way that he would go out and buy illegal fireworks and light them off on the 4th of July, he'd be able to launch this ballistic missile to destroy an asteroid. It's just that if there were to be that person, he would be, and SpaceX would be, that operation, understanding all of the perils and the secrecy and the, and the ridiculous, implausible nature that would go around doing something like that. There is only one man on the planet, and it is only because of his actions over the last 10 years that he has put himself in that position that should that happen, theoretically, he would at least have the tools and the gumption to say, I'm space Batman and I'm destroying Space Joker, which is the asteroid that's going to destroy the Earth. But but I guess this is the part that weirds me out, is that you guys seem to think that the way he would do it would be to, in secret, develop a plan and launch without authorization. Uh, no, no, that's the scenario. What if he wanted to do it that yeah. way? How no, cool no, would it yeah, be? Yeah, I don't think that they would do that. I'm just saying no. that that would I mean, be he'd a say, thing. Hey, I've got it the technology. But we're thinking, like, what if he had a plan? What if he's saying, what if we had a government that saw this not as a threat, didn't know, or he was... I mean, if you had this power to avert world-ending cataclysm, would you say, hey, let's put together, let's figure out how could we pull this off? Uh, okay. I, I don't necessarily understand the question, but uh, uh, the, like, 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 I mean, 
I think that it would be a collaboration from the beginning and that everybody would want to put their, you know, smear their butts on it so it had their stink on it. Yes. And then they could all take credit for personally well, saving like, the world. Is, how cool would it be if he just decided, let me have my backup plan of doing it on my own? Well, that's, it's like, it's like, that's the question. You don't have to say, yes, that's what's happening. It's just... That'd be kind of, it's a neat thing to think about. I would do that, but that's why I don't have SpaceX and <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> like, Brian, you know, like every once in a while, you'll see like news stories that are like the Pentagon's secret plan to invade China. And it's like these super, uh, you know, like detailed, if crazy stuff happened, here is how we would, you know, here are the people that we would look to seize and here are the cities we would look to deploy troops in and here's how many people it would take. And it's like, yeah, because if you're the Pentagon, and you're paying people, you know, you should be thinking about every possible contingency so we're never left with our pants down. What if, theoretically, Elon Musk, and again, bears repeating, SpaceX started as the concept of him putting a webcam in a greenhouse on Mars, like, because he wanted people to be fascinated by space and space exploration and Mars in general. So he is prone to completely outside the box thinking, like, with, like, the Hyperloop. What, I mean, what would it be if he like one weekend gets a wild hair up his butt because he reads this thing that like, well, you know, in the next 50 years, we might know if there's going to be an asteroid that would come near us. Like, what if he's like, well, not on my watch, bro. I'm starting the, uh, I'm, I'm the captain of the Milky Way's neighborhood watch. And I'm, I'm getting ready for the, the war if it goes off. And I'm gonna just get my people together and see what would happen, even if it was just, hey, we need to, to have everything set so when we go to the government, we can say, like, all right, this is what we have in place. This is our contingency for when this happens. If he just got a wild hair about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, if the if the whole if the thesis is, does he have a plan? I'll, I bet money that he probably does. I bet I bet that that's already done and not even a, a wild speculation. I, I, I totally would believe that they've run scenarios and come up with what it would cost, how fast they could do it. And, and, and in fact, probably includes what politicians they need to call and, and what wheels they need to grease to make it happen. I think you brought up a great point, the cost. What if he has the plan and then he's a price tag? He calls it the president. I got this. They're like, oh, Mr. Musk, thank you so much. One trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty much how that would go. Right. You know, it's like it, it wouldn't be said that way. It would be said as well, as you can understand, there's a sizable investment of my cost. <laughs> I don't think he's going to do a thousand percent markup, but I'd, who knows? I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to partner with the United States government for single handedly <laughs> just saving the world. That would be like an awesome scenario. He's like, OK, uh, what's the weight of the asteroid? How far is it? OK, for option A. Two billion dollars. <laughs> well, or, or I, what he would say is, uh, is uh, granted that we're saving the world, we'd like to participate in revenues moving forward. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. And as is standard to all asteroid destruction schemes, we don't want to pay taxes ever. And, and we don't want liability. Like, Was that from Armageddon? And he's like, yes. He's like, okay. <laughs> Was that in Armageddon? I never finished yeah. it. Yeah. 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 That's by the way, that's the deal. That's the deal that those guys swing to go up and, and destroy an asteroid is they don't want to pay taxes ever, which is like almost the most like poetic and and uh, ridiculously awesome element of that movie is that it is so blue collar fantasy that it's like that's the height. The height of we want to save the world is we don't want to pay taxes. All right. Uh, gentlemen, you ready for something else weird? Ready. Let's go. I want you to give us a country that we're going to go to war with. Estonia. Estonia. All right. Estonia develops world-class military power. Estonia starts projecting its power around the world. You, Brian Brushwood. You, Justin Robert Young. By the way, we had to we had to watch out how bad we talk about Estonia as this Estonian product Skype that we are talking on right now might immediately cut out. Yeah, well, keep in mind also that uh, the uh, the chat room being hosted in Estonia by our own T two T two. There's a reason I picked Estonia. <laughs> Fantastic. We go to war with Estonia. Okay, right? maybe we're the bad guys. All right, doesn't matter. Projecting their power around the world, you guys get drafted into the military. 
Mm. Like, you know what? You guys are very resourceful. Man, Justin- I'm trying to figure out like what the military would want with me or Justin. I'm <laughs> like- explaining. <laughs> all right. All right. Justin can blend in anywhere. He can look like anybody on any continent, any place. He's the Brian, he's, he's, he's the chameleon of race. Resourceful guy, right? Okay. Okay. I, I, I have faith in you. I believe in you. All right. I make you guys part of a crack team, right? But we send you into the wilds of Estonia, into the forests of Estonia, where there are important highways and roads going through there. And this is your operation. Sabotage. What I want you guys to do is to hide out in the woods, maybe destroy some roads, some bridges, maybe give you guys some sniper rifles. You see any Estonians, pop them. Just pop one here, pop one there. Military uh, well, targets. Off, we please. need nicknames. Do it, uh, oh man, uh, I'm Mustache Pete and Brian's old white face. <laughs> Ghost face killer. There you go. So you're behind the signs there. You guys now behind the signs, behind the lines there. You guys know how to survive. I mean, there's now. signs on the line, so you were right yes. both times. You guys know how to survive. You know how to eat tree bark. You know how to live off the land, right? So now you're in there, and you guys are waging your two man war. In Estonia. So you our would... our entire mission statement is to just tear junk up. Just just tear make... junk up, destroy mm-hmm. opportunities, terror. So it spreads pretty soon. People are like, holy crap, there's something horrible off in the woods there. Don't go there. Military convoy routes decide to not take those roads. People are afraid to go around there. You you're do... disrupting things there. You All see right. Estonian troops, you shoot at them. Do, do you think, Justin, that maybe to enhance things, we need to go the Scooby-Doo route? Like, maybe start some legends? Dress like girls? No, <laughs> yes, no, like, 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 start legends of, like, uh, I don't know, super intelligent Sasquatch that has a gun. Oh, or... so we start, we start rumors, and then, like, where the uh, old man withers at the immune, uh, the amusement park? That's what I'm saying, it's like, it's like, it's, it turns out Brian and Justin just wanted to scare us off from the woods! And we wouldn't have gotten away with it, too, if it weren't for you meddling Estonians. <laughs> so, you guys are over there, and you're pretty successful at it, right? But then your communications with, like, you know, your commanding officers, they, your radio gets busted, whatever. You have no way to communicate with them, and you're deep behind enemy lines. Right? Also too busy having fun. Right. Did you see so, that semi I blew up? So, like, and then you get, like, the Estonians are in a panic, so you're out there, and so the Estonians are like, uh, you can come out now. It's all okay. Come on out now. So they have us surrounded. No, well, no, no. There's like some guy out they're there. They're just shouting from outside the tank. woods. They're all they're all like, uh, no, um, we we like made peace with America, so everything's fine now. Come be our friend. Come have this delicious Estonian buffet. It's like whatever. They're gonna they're gonna get a they're gonna get a rock across their nose. All right, you do but that. And then at that Ooh. point, I mean, do we just live in the woods forever? Like, are we just wood hermits? Until, I mean, we, we tear... We, is this the end for old white face and mustache Pete? <laughs> we were given no. one miss- mission, Pete, and that is to tear stuff up. And that is what we'll do until we die or until Eisenhower rolls up and tells us we've done good. You I make mean, a good are point, clever, man. They're clever. You know, they get some women coming out. They're like, hey, guys, come on out. It's all good now. We're friends. Yeah, I, I still don't believe it. No. I mean, it's like maybe, uh, do they have other Americans? But, oh, but they'll, they probably have fake Americans. They probably have people who like speak really good English. They're like, hey, guys, come on out. I got the newest Beach Boys record. <laughs> <laughs> have uh, you guys been watching that hot new series on A&E, Don't Trust Andrew Maine, Mondays at 10 p.m.? <laughs> Look at this. There's going to be new Star Wars movies. Fan of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, uh, let's rock that ace of bass, gentlemen, and dance the <laughs> Macarena. <laughs> and then it's just it's just them playing the ace of bass album over and over and over again. Ah, uh, dude, they're they're all taking bullets I'm in the faces. Find you. So you're just you're shooting them, and so you notice that like they uh they tend not to come around as much. <laughs> Yeah, good. That means I that means I've done my job. That means I own this territory. I'm here. This is my land. So like you guys you guys hold fast. So you're waiting for at what point 
do you guys decide? I mean, until until all of a sudden, like um, blue jeans start falling from the sky in parachutes, and we know that clearly uh, America won, and we're showering well, our consumer goods all over these poor, benighted Estonians. I mean, let, let me ask you this. So in this scenario, do we have any kind of fail-safe words like from the government? Like, is it one of those things that since we're behind enemy lines... Like we would have to be given a certain kind of transmission to know that everything was okay. Well, I well, you had like a radio. The problem is, is uh, I mean, this was this is a big messy war, big big messy, and it's like you literally rushed into an office, and I'm like, all right, guys, this is what you got to do. Here's your maps. Here's this, whatever. Good luck. And and you rushed out the door, and so okay. here's your radio. Just use this to communicate. So at that point, I mean, it seems like after waiting for a very long time that, you know, it would be in our interest to try and disguise ourselves and, and see what's going on to go out and, and like, uh, Oh, so you're saying, you're saying, uh, uh, white face maybe rubs some dirt on his face. Yes. Mustache Pete maybe gives a little trim. Yeah. And and the two of us, now he's, uh, Hitler Joe. Okay. (laughs) And he's popular in Estonia in war torn Estonia at the time. Here's the problem is you, neither of you guys really speak Estonian really well. Oh, um, I bet the two of us could, like, fake sign language. Most of our signs are, are like, are like, like that's, you know, just kind of... So, Brian, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. Yep. What you imagine, two dirty German guys in some region that's been having a lot of guerrilla warfare come out of the woods and start asking questions in World War II, you know, in England. It's probably not going to go well. Yeah. We should probably uh, just yeah, shoot everyone. We're uh, do- is tourists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. Now I'm going to ask a controversial question. In this scenario, would it make sense to act mentally handicapped? That's like exactly. profoundly mentally handicapped. That was- Could you credibly act like a mentally handicapped Estonian? As an American who knows none of the language. You're in a region where they're terrorized by people. Everybody knows everybody. And you're going to be the stranger walking out of the woods. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's any way. Plus, also, I mean, I would imagine that an Estonian can, like, identify a non-Estonian. Like, my and, guess and listen, is- they have a huge tradition of guerrilla warfare themselves. The Estonian Forest Brothers was a group that was an anti-communist group in the Baltics that were, like, launching campaigns for years and years against the Russians. <laughs> And the Soviet power. So they know this. So, I mean, and this is actually, this is probably very real in that, like, this is what they did in, uh, uh, what the Taliban did in Afghanistan, right? To, to send the Russians packing. Uh, what Osama bin Laden But this is different. You're behind enemy lines. Yeah, no, they, they had home court advantage. That's true. The Taliban. So I guess we would be doing guerrilla warfare from behind enemy lines, which does complicate things. I, I, I guess the question is how long do we go? Until, because you're right. Like the problem is when you make that jump, you're not making the jump to do a little recon and learn stuff because we don't speak Estonian. We don't know what what the words are. Uh, Pretty much you're just going to at some point make the jump and like, I'm pretty sure the war is over now. And it's like, I don't know that I would do that at any point. Here's the thing, like you knew when the war would be over because you would see American flags everywhere. That's your assumption is the war was going to be over and you'd see American flags all around. Yeah. Um, there's no way we're so going to lose. At that point, if, if the idea of reconnaissance is out and we have no solid way of waiting for a uh, definite American contact, then you got to figure we go out in a blaze of glory, right? You know, we're, we're, it's, it's suicide packed old white face. Man. So the scenario wait, wait, as you oh, made wait, hold, was actually hold, relevant to wait, a real hold, one. Hold on, mustache Pete. I mean, it's like you're saying, you know, suicide time. Uh, we got food. We're just we're just hanging out here. Why why not keep hanging out? What's wrong with a? We're just here. Let's just. You want to know what old white face? I agree. Smash cut. Two years. The food's gone. Old white face. <laughs> Remember that plan I had about suicide? Uh, yeah, no, but uh, uh you know, we got we there's there some. I saw a deer the other day. Maybe we can we can hunt a deer and then occasionally throw rocks at those Estonians. Why don't we do so, that? So bringing this to a close, <laughs> the scenario I played out. Uh, actually happened, not in Estonia, but as you know, in the Philippines, Hiru Inada, who was a Japanese soldier sent behind the lines in the Philippines during World War II to do guerrilla warfare, 
was the last holdout, was the guy that refused to surrender. The Philippines, Philip, you know, the Philippine government's like, hey, war is over. He didn't believe it. They would get Japanese people to say, hey, war is over. Didn't believe it. This guy was there for 30 years. Finally, they had to get, I guess, his former commanding officer to show up and say, wow. no, really, it's over. And we're doing pretty good now. Don't worry. We didn't win, but more, we more than made up for it. So, and so when, when was this? Like th- uh, 30 years 1974 after the war? 1974 was when he finally surrendered. He went from World War II to 1974, 30 years in the Philippine jungle. And, and, but, but, but it was known he was there during that 30 years, right? They're they, like, they knew there was a guy there out there you know, terrorizing. They knew there was some guy there, but he just eluded capture. Well, the, I guess the reason I'm asking is because the only reason I'm familiar with this idea, this construct that 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 somebody would not know the war is over, is because I saw it in a Gilligan's Island episode. That was based on him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I figured that's the case, but I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying to line everything up. Like, had the guy surrendered by the time that episode came out? Um, there were other holdouts there too. Um, that's the thing. Like, there were. Uh, other other people out there. I mean, it was it was not an uncommon. So, so thing. it was a, it was a common story that there were people yeah. who yeah, weren't Gilligan's giving up. Gilligan's Island and, came out like ten years before this guy finally surrendered. So, okay, but, so yeah, so I guess by that point, even if there were, you know, even if this last guy was still holding the line, it was it was still ripe for parody on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, it was it was a common thing. They are very persistent people. <laughs> that's that's if you say what you will about the Japanese, they are very persistent. Yes. Very uh, attention to very detail. dedicated, and <laughs> so there you see the problem. When do you surrender? So uh, Hiro Onada, the last Japanese soldier to, to surrender, apparently must be some other guy out there. He just died this week at ninety-one. Wow! Afterwards, Dude. he became the celebrity because, like, thirty years, kind of the wound sort of healed. He went around did a tour of the United States. What? You know? Oh, they're like, yeah, because it's like, hey, look at this guy. They're all like, hey, guy. remember when we, we – hey, uh, you, you know what was, was wild? I was reading um, uh, some story about uh, – I think it was uh, like a, a minor item in a Cracked article that, that led me to a study that just went – I went straight down a rabbit hole where uh, – did you know that up until World War II and including World War II, when they, uh, uh, they debriefed people after the fact and asked uh, how many times did you shoot at the enemy – what percentage of all the warriors do you think shot with the intent to kill the enemy? I remember hearing some study that it was really low. It was like 20 or 30 percent or something. And then we, we tried to we redesign our entire way of training people post-World War II. And, and that may have caused more problems. 15 percent. 15 percent of people actually shot at the enemy. Uh, and in fact, you, 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 they're, they're, uh, oftentimes if, if a commanding officer is like, no, you have to kill them, turns out like it's really hard to intentionally kill another yeah. person. And so they, uh, a lot of people would, would, you know, they would run uh, materiel from point A to point B. They would help with, uh, with stuff. They would run wherever they were told to run, but they just weren't so hot on actually shooting the enemy. And so it started a program. That uh, that turned out to be you know brutally effective in Korea and in Vietnam, where it was intentionally to dehumanize the enemy, to uh, uh, to to you know the the language change to you know neutralize threats or whatever, and, it, and then it mm-hmm. went up to like ninety percent or something ridiculous. Yeah. I wonder how much of that also depends on on like a volunteer admission versus a draft. Like if if you know if, if you are volunteering for the military, are you just that much closer to being able to make those decisions psychologically than just the wide swath of everybody in your population. Well, if, if that was the case, then you would expect that the more draftees you would have, the less they would want to shoot. But yeah. it turns out that, you know, you, you got uh, Vietnam that had the draft. And uh, so these are all people who don't want to be at war. But the but by this point, they got in the program figured out. And, gotcha. then, and and they they made killers out of out of all those every everyday Joes. And more comedy on the Weird Things podcast. <laughs> so, time for one more. Yeah, Hell yeah. Uh, real with well, two ones, mini one. Um, you know the you hear the what happened to the uh, was it the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil, the big huge Christ statue uh, standing on the mountain. Yeah, it pulled a he man Christ the Redeemer up there saying. By the power of Grayskull, I have the power. And then lightning struck him, made him look total badass. But then his fingers fell off, so yes. it kept him from becoming He-Man. Yeah, very good. Struck a lot, but you know that's what happens. But he's still there. 
Uh, this is cool. So over at, um, I see this via Gawker.com, but I think it may have been, was it a Gawker or io9? They have a great, great, they did a really cool thing for Hey Science. And it was, are there still sea monsters? And so they did a query. They asked some experts to see, do you still think that there could be sea monsters lurking in the deep? And how likely is it there are large, say, giant squid size or better sea monsters have yet to be discovered? And they get some great quotes. Uh, Gustav Polly, curator of marine malacology at the Florida Museum of Natural History. He says there's a pretty good chance there's some large animals remain undiscovered. He uh, talks about beaked whales, a group of cetaceans that's hard to encounter that keeps getting discovered. Uh, there's a cool, he says there's an, an undescribed beaked whale that is being eaten in the, the Kiribati Islands. So here's a, a mammal, even, beaked mammal that we're finding, a whale, which could be, you know, porpoise size or bigger. Uh, he says that, you know, there are a few giant quids, could be some more giant squid out there. There could be large fish. He mentions the Megamouth, which was just discovered a couple decades ago. Uh, Tim the Essington, professor of aquatic and fishery science, University of Washington. It'd be interesting if you saw somebody who's like a professor of like, you know, ocean science and it's like, you know, Utah or someplace where yeah. not a lot of access. I'm sure it could happen. Uh, he writes, he wouldn't be surprised if some intrepid explorer discovered some, discovered some new bizarre form of sea life. He says it could be something enormous radically new body design or some unique way that it makes a living. And, uh, I, I, I've got a question like, you know, mostly when we think of like what undiscovered sea monsters or critters out in the wild, like the first thing we go to is size, right? Because we want to be impressed by something so big and so elusive. And so, you know, like a giant squid, that kind of thing. Uh, but I wonder if that there exists, um, life at a level that we just can't perceive it either because the, the processes of it are so, you know, unfathomably slow that even though it's like, let's even make it a, a, a conscious entity, but it's just on another level, you know, like, like we're all mayflies and this thing's a freaking, you know, a, a sequoia, basically. Like there's no way a mayfly could ever perceive a sequoia is living. Yeah, I, sure. I mean, in some scale, I think what, what, what I love about this question, though, is the idea that we're talking big stuff. Is there big stuff out yeah. there? And some of the examples, like we didn't know about the giant six foot tall tube worms on hydrothermal vents until 1977. You know, these things are huge and, and living in a very hostile environment. And you've got jellyfish, the pink meanie with 70 foot long tentacles. And just the idea that there are these really big sea monster type esque stuff to me is is kind of awesome. You know, it's like, you know, the, the way we knew about giant squid is we would find their scars on sperm whales. You know, we'd From find battles? their beaks inside of their stomachs. Ugh. And that's yeah. the ones that weren't good enough to get away from sperm whales. What's out there that can that can get away or can elude or maybe goes even deeper than they go? Have have you? I, I guess the implication there is is you know if you want to get in, a, in an even more hostile environment and you want to get even bigger, like has there been any talk about what a a free range space based life form would look like? I mean, would it be like a giant whale that just uh, kind of has a mass drive and, a, and an unfathomably long lifespan to sort of just jet around from area to area and soak up maybe a photosynthesize as it goes. It just collects energy from the sun and, and derives its power from that. I would, I would imagine for something like that to potentially be viable, it needs to be in some sort of, environment where there's a lot more material there's a higher density of that so you know maybe if we were to look through you know the rings of saturn or oh no okay no that's all right so picture picture uh some planet you got uh let's say a gas giant with with like crazy rings uh and a, and a wide variety of stuff there's there's um there's water okay okay here, here we go so imagine imagine this green-skinned gigantic beast that uh that uh that gets its energy from the sun by photosynthesis, but it needs water. That's what it hunts from place to place. So it's got to move its body to where the water is for the process to warm it up and everything. Uh, and so the way it propels itself, the way it gets around is that it, it, it grabs it picture, a bunch of arms. It just grabs rocks and just throws rocks to get from place to place to place, seeking more and more water. And then, uh, and then you having to fight, I don't know, another dude at some point. Is that too weird? Is that is that idiotic talk? I don't know. 
<laughs> no, I guess, Ryan. I mean, that's the thing. I, guess, like, Off the pod, <laughs> I, I thought this was a safe place, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I mean, but like part of it is, you know, that's like, we can't figure out what's in our own oceans, you know, and like like Andrew mentioned the idea, if you were to tell somebody we're doing the 1976 version of this podcast, right. you know, and and so, and and you said, really uh, well, weird. listen, there's there's a six foot, but what if a uh, six foot worms lived on the vents at the bottom of the ocean, we would have the same reaction to you talking about your crazy space whale <laughs> That's true. floating through the, the, the rings of, uh, of a, of a far flung planet. Like we would have no idea. I mean, like the, the, it stands to reason that things live in these insanely hostile environments. So maybe why not? Gentlemen picks. Oh man! I, normally, I come prepared. I didn't even think ahead to picks, um, so I'll go. I'll go late last. Andrew, you got something? Let me pull uh, up. You know what? Bunch. Actually, I'll go. I'll go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna bunt here. Hey, you know what? Bonnie pointed out she didn't know whether to use the word bunt or punt, and I realized Guess that which game she's playing. Well, well, yeah, but but as far as the metaphor to not really try to score. But instead, just do a little thing that progresses you. I guess the two could be used interchangeably, couldn't no. they? No, no. Bunt. No. You'd want to use bunt because bunt in baseball is just to take that minimal. In football, you always start with a punt. Well, and a punt. A punt would be. I don't want to deal with this now. Let me push this down the road to deal with it later. That's what the metaphor for punt would be. Okay, but like if you wanted to half-ass a thing, like uh, like you're like, well, it should be done this way, but. I'm just gonna at least get some of it done. If if what you're if if you aim to put forth a little effort to clear it from your ledger, yeah, it's a bunt. If you aim to put it off so you can deal with it with your full attention later, it's a punt. Huh. All right. So which which am I doing right now by saying I'm? If you're going offering to a crappy pick, you are bunting. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm I'm, I'm actually I'm going to reuse a, an old pick that we had talked about okay. before, but I know we got new listeners and it came up in conversation. Uh, recently, um, somebody, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the organization, the doomsday clock, you know, those guys, yeah, yeah, they, uh, they, uh, the, they're still at it. And, and uh, weirdly, I really found that them an intimidating and important organization 30 years ago during the cold war, uh, when, when the threat of nuclear domination, and by the way, if you were born in 1990s, screw you because, you don't know what real fear is like. You don't know when, when everything and was, was about like, hey, by the way, we could all get nuked at any given moment. And that was the threat they were talking about when they said the doomsday clock. And as tensions would get higher, they would try to make it clear that you guys are about to ruin the world with your arguing and your nuclear bombs by moving the clock hand closer to midnight. The idea being at midnight where they're like, told you so. And then they fly off in their, their space boats. Uh, <laughs> but the... It, it, the Cold War ended and the nuclear threat is, you know, it's not over, but I think it's safe to say that if we were at three minutes to midnight in 1984 with the threat of global annihilation from nuclear war, um, we're like six months earlier than that now, as far as like the imminent threat goes. Uh, but these guys have rebranded and now the doomsday clock is... Basically, as best I could tell, uh, a full scale nonstop scaremongering facility where it's like now it's <laughs> now it's it's global climate change and this and that. And just everybody, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, all of a sudden I just hate what they're doing. It's like it's nothing but naked scaremongering that gets us nothing. So as a result, my pick is and I got into, into a little bit of a scuffle with somebody on Twitter where they're saying, no, they're doing a really good job of bringing you know, awareness to this threat. And I'm like, yeah, th th that was a threat. It's like, um, I, I would say things like, uh, but the problem is we live in the most peaceful era in the entire history of mankind. Full stop. No argument by, by light years. Uh, and, well, and, Brian. Yeah, I know. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and they're like, wait, how can you say that? And the answer is because I've read Steven Pinker's book, better angels, angels of our nature. Uh, and it's utterly life changing. Uh, when you hear what used to pass for entertainment 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, it is difficult. It's difficult to even listen to the audiobook where, where he describes all this stuff. However, it is simultaneously unfathomably 
inspiring as you realize that that by every objective measure, this is far and away the best time to ever be a human being in the history of the universe. You live the longest, you're the happiest, you're the healthiest. It's the most peaceful, most cooperative, uh, most magical time in all of history. So if you want to feel inspired and also kind of disgusted by your great, 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 great grandfathers, then uh, definitely uh, pick up Steven Pinker's book. It's, I just, just gave that to somebody to read because and I, I, I it's frustrating because you know, I encounter intelligent, well-educated people and you bring up, well, you know, we're better off like, oh, no, oh, no, we're not. And it's like, OK, let's come up with objective ways that we can measure this, you know, and and, it, and it's it's amazing how in, in education, how inculcated people can be into the world is broken. And oh, yeah, it's been broken since it began. So are we. But we get better. And the idea though, that, that, that one, that we're in this, that the perpetual belief that we're in a state of decline is, you know, every generation believes it from, you know, the, the Babylonians on forward. We're, we're in a constant state of decline. What's, you know, the, what's the, uh, the quote, um, the, uh, the guy, uh, the lead, uh, D Snyder from twisted sister wrote a book like in the eighties and the opening page had a quote, like this generation is awful. They're prone to drink. They get nothing done. They're, they, they, they just talk endlessly and they're listless. Uh, I fear for our future. And then it says like Cicero 2000 yes. BC. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we have that. And it's, and it's one of those things where you can say, well, this is a question we can answer with science. We can ask this question and, and, and come up with a, you know, an answer explains it. And it doesn't mean that there's not bad in the world. There's a lot of bad, and a lot of personal things and people that get affected by it. And it's just that weird that to acknowledge things are better. I've always been, yeah, I've always been frustrated like you with the doomsday clock. It's just, it's a political, it's a, it's scientists getting engaged in politics in a way that I don't think is helpful. And it, and it brings down science to the level of ideology. And every time we do that, I don't think you solve problems. You just bring in all the problems of politics and make things worse. Uh, so I, I heartily agree with you. I think it's a great pick. And, I, and, I, and I'll get people like, no, it's not true. It's worse. Like, read this. Get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and again, it's like there's what your gut tells you. There's the, the And it, it's funny because like over the last couple of years, I've read a bunch of books that sort of deconstruct the human mind. And, uh, you know, you read uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, talking about, um, uh, oh, I forget the title of it, but the one where it's like you got two brains working, system one, system two, and your intuitive gut is basically what kept you alive because they go up one point every 10 years. Uh, you know, it's 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 an amazing... I, I had this thought today, or yesterday. Uh, YouTube is far and away uh, light years better greater than the library of Alexandria. Like YouTube is the sum total of, of human knowledge, uh, put in video form for explanations. I would maybe use Wikipedia as my example of that. No, I would say, I would say YouTube specifically. I just, just, I just for the volume. I, I would, I would have trouble finding, knowing what are facts and finding them in YouTube. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, you can't learn to dance very well from Wikipedia. You can't learn to change a carburetor very well from Wikipedia. If yeah, but you if can, I wanted to find out like certain, I, I would just say is its, it's ability. How th there's not, a reason there's a reason that Khan Academy doesn't use Wikipedia articles to teach people. It uses YouTube videos selected by people from Khan. That's what I'm saying. There's a selection process that makes Khan Academy fantastic. I'm saying that if you just gave me YouTube and said find this, I can I can name a number of topics that I'm going to get very well ill informed about because there's not the same sort of process that we use in other things of you know how do we. How do we figure out, you know, what's more like, I love, again, I'm not dissing, I think the sure, I sure, think sure. content is there. Right. I just think, I'm trying to think like, how would I. You're, you're, you're talking about the filtering problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we know the, the examples that, yeah, I mean, Wikipedia is not like the be all, but I'm like, Khan like, love it. It's great. And you right. can find those things there, but I can think of a lot of like paranormal stuff, things like that, where you could be, you hit the wrong tangent. You're tore, and, and, and again, not to devalue it that's, all. That's I true. However, in my defense, my guess is there are some crappy books in the Library of Alexandria as well. <laughs> Oh, for sure, for sure. But I would, I would hope that you know the Hypatia or whatever who organized it would probably say, okay, we're going to put this over in the paranormal because it doesn't meet these criteria. I don't know. Again, but I think I, I don't want to devalue that at all. I love it. I mean, my point, my, is, my point is, my point is, is that last week was the crappiest books in the Library of Alexandria that will haunt your dreams. <laughs> I, I guess my my point is is that um, you know YouTube has a reputation of being cat videos, but like secretly YouTube has. Some it's of amazing. the most important educational content Absolutely. that you're ever going to run across. Absolutely. I, that, Absolutely. That excites that me. Doubt. 
I, I, I totally support your statement there, sir. I have a pick. Go. Up. The Watched movie? Just watched it again. Just love that movie. Just so love good. Up. It's such a fun movie. Uh, question. Is the fact that Monsters Universe, uh, University was not nominated for a Best Animated Feature Oscar, the Academy members punishing Pixar for doing sequels? I Because that movie was good. I really liked it. I thought it was, and it was certainly better than uh, Cars 2 and, and some of the other stuff that... Uh, you know, I, I would I would rank it ahead of some other stuff that Pixar has gotten nominated for, but it just uh, it's an interesting question if maybe there is backlash to Pixar doing sequels. I've I've only half seen it in that uh, like I've seen bits and pieces and I've listened to the entire thing as the kids watch it in the back of the car. Uh, so it's I can't really speak to that. I don't know if it's that. If mm, I I can't answer. I don't know. I it's the I watched the of the nominated feature films. I only saw. Frozen, and but you know, Despicable Me Two got nominated, so I don't know how much of a sequel prejudice there is then if they did that. Uh, yeah, I guess if, if it would be if they, if they want and expect better of Pixar, and they want to punish Pixar, you, you think they're for, being for held to the, the unfair, trend. the Pixar standard unfairly? Yeah, I mean, I don't. Again, I've I've only seen of the nominees. I only saw Frozen, which I really enjoyed. I, I like Monsters University more than Frozen, which I enjoyed Frozen, but I like Monsters University more. I do think that, you know, it is like you watch, you know, the poignant Toy Story 3 and then, you know, Monsters University just a more fun follow-up. So, maybe. Uh, but up. Yeah, so that's just my pick. I just go back, watch it. You know, it's one of those things where the, those first 10 minutes was, oh, dude, where, where like the, the robot test where basically in the first 10 minutes it finds out whether or not you're a human being by, by yeah. making you cry. Yeah, to get you so engaged and so pulled into those characters so quickly and so readily, it's just 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 an amazing sort of well done story. Was there telling. anything that you caught the second time watching it that you missed the first time? Hmm. I guess Not that I noticed. Yeah. You know, it's funny because Up is really, you know, I think we would all agree it kind of goes into the the masterworks of, of Pixar and, you know, a, a greater among equals uh, in terms of their best work because it has, I mean, for a movie that deals with fairly mature themes like aging and dying and loss and, and uh, regret and stuff like that, to wrap that up in a movie that has kids movie beats, like there still are there. You're never really far away from a laugh. You're never far away from a big physical action moment. Like it really is a, a work of art. I mean, uh, up is just the rarest of all birds when it comes to stuff like that, even for Pixar. Well, And, and keep in mind, like up and Wally, I think we're back to back. Right. And both of them were extremely just heavy, like one dealing with the nature of growing old and dying and never quite realizing your dreams. The other with the, the fact that all of humanity eventually is going to chew up and spit out the husk of planet earth. And we're going to go off. Um, do, like, do those movies have, I would be really curious about the replayability of them. Like, I don't see a lot of Up merchandise, and, I've, and I've, I see maybe a, a, a tiny bit of WALL-E merchandise. It's just, as, as much as I value the artistic decisions to explore those worlds and to give that kind of texture, like, my kids don't beg me to put that back on. You know, they want to go watch the stuff that's fun to watch again and again and again. Well, you know that, that like, with the number one or the number two brand, and children's merchandise is cars. Cars, cars, yeah. yeah. That's why there will always be cars movies. We will yeah. all die while cars related feature films are being produced with a Larry the Cable Guy voice impressionist doing Mater. I actually uh, I liked I liked Cars. And yes, it was Doc Hollywood. Yes, it was a familiar song, but it was exquisitely performed. Was, I mean, they're just masters of of doing that stuff. I didn't see Cars 2 though, which I heard was a hot uh, mess. I liked I liked Cars. I didn't love Cars. Cars 2 is not a good movie. Like, it's just, it's simply, and it as weird, especially for Pixar kind of decisions on like, there's like a lot of gunplay. <laughs> there's like a lot of gun violence. There, there's like, there's too. like a torture scene in there, right? There's a torture scene. There's like pee jokes and stuff that, that don't usually make their way into Pixar movies. It was just odd, odd to see. Justin, do you have a pick? 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and shout out a friend of uh, this show, and, and hopefully we'll have him on in the next uh, couple of weeks. But uh, Scott Sigler, uh, our friend, science fiction author, has got a brand new book out called Pandemic. Uh, you can go ahead and pre-order it now uh, at scottsigler.com. He's doing a big book tour. So uh, if you uh, dig on Sigler and really who doesn't, go on over there and uh, see if he's coming to a town near you. But I believe he's going through uh, Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, um, and then back to the West Coast. So go ahead and check it out. And if you want to see us uh, having fun with them on NSFW Show, download the uh, latest episode of NSFW Show with me and Brian. I believe it's called Nine Fangs of, of My Aunt. The Nine Fangs of My Aunt, yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm glad you reminded me because just today I was listening to a podcast. I got all caught up on my podcast. I was like, ah, I got to start an audiobook, and I didn't know what I was going to start. But now uh, I'm going to start that whole trilogy if, since it's on Audible. Yeah, we're going to try to see if Scott's available to come in here and maybe do a pandemic-themed weird things. Yeah. No, I think that would be great. He's been, of course, been on the show before, and, and we will be excited to have him back on again. And I think, uh, yeah, I believe it's Infected, uh, oh, man, Contagion, I think, is the, the middle one, and then Pandemic. Uh, yes. Infected, uh, The Sneezing, I believe, is the <laughs> second one. Uh, but go ahead and check it out, scottsegler.com. Very good. Well, gentlemen, it's been weird. Look at that. 60 minutes on the nose. Boom. That stuff, this stuff is tight. Man, that chat room, huh? That, that is, that is lagtastic, that chat room. That's kooky. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, I do have uh, some news in that regard. Uh, I talked to Andrew Zarian. Who uh, uses um, Andrew's Arian? I didn't know you knew about my Arian. <laughs> Andrew Zarian uh, has a uh, uh, you know a separate computer that that does nothing but encode and spits out to all of the various uh, uh, places. And he said that far and away the lag on Daily Motion because it's a new service that they're just starting to offer. You have to get approved to be like an official partner or whatever. Um, but he says that it's three seconds. Like just, just yeah. like that. So uh, I I went ahead and applied for that, and I'm also looking into uh, just getting another computer in here to offload the encoding so that we can send out to because we got the bandwidth now. We could do yeah. UStream, we could do Justin, and we could do Daily Motion, and have people use whichever one they want. Man, you know the bummer about doing that is if you're switching services, then it would just be hard to have people go to different sites and different sites and different sites to follow you. It'd be really, really cool if we just had one destination that we could tell people to go to. Um, you know, it'd be, kind of, you know, it'd be yeah. rad is if it was, it was like one destination with like an auto refreshing, like you yeah. knew if, if you or me or Andrew or Tom Merritt or Veronica Bellamont, if any of us was live doing anything like you knew that it was going to be on there. And then, uh, and then like when we're not on, it could be like a community thing where it's like, you just, uh, like like new scam school drops or whatever, you go to that page and you're like, oh, I guess we're all watching the new scam school episode or something. That'd be pretty cool, Brian. Or like revisiting classic stuff, like like throwbacks, or it's like, hey, let's all listen to Night Attack One or whatever. Yeah, but it would just be one kind of persistent chat room where people could stay forever, and you know, we could build in a lot of cool bells and whistles and stuff to it. Dare to dream. That'd be cool. Yeah. Keep dreaming, guys. Because if, if if that did exist, I would think that I personally pretty much always would have that page open and the chat open and be participating and just chit I think everybody would. Yeah. I think it would be safe to say that uh, that would just be a place where everybody could always know something was going on and just be uh, tuned into the coolest stuff that they like to listen to. It would be like a it would be like an actual home for the day. It would be the Diamond Club. It would be it a would, home yeah, for no. the Diamond Club. I wish... I could participate in this, guys, if this hypothetical thing ever came true. I would well, love Well, you know, it would make talk. sense, right, Andrew? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we do weird things. You do the Maniac podcast. You've been doing a lot of the Google Hangouts uh, live. It would just be, it would, it, you know, and that's the thing about Google Hangouts is you, know, you have a couple people that you can bring on, uh, but you would still kind of want that, that chat experience where everybody possible could interact with you. I mean, it would just kind of take things to another level. Yeah. Well, guys, I wish we lived in an age where this was possible. Yeah, no, yep. But we don't. Nope. Uh, it's not nope. Happening. Sad trombone. <laughs> wait, By the wait. way, uh, Justin. Yes. 
Oh, pardon me. Sorry. I accidentally twi- clicked on Twitch TV. Uh, <laughs> could I get you to do a, a stinger at the end or whatever? Point out there's a free episode of Don't Trust Andrew Maine on iTunes. Uh, yeah, I'll change the the opener. Okay. Uh, like, there's yeah, always two episodes. I, I always have free, the, like an, the on thing ATV. At, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, the thing at the beginning where it's like, yeah. like I, I mean, changed it to last week. I had it, you know, tune in live for the. Uh, thing and also plug the Maniac podcast and this time I'll change it to go download the first episode for free yeah, on iTunes. I know a lot of our podcast listeners are cord cutters, so <laughs> figure yeah. maybe tell them where they can get um, free Absolutely. TV. Um, but yeah, and thanks to everybody. Oh, for I, I, I didn't get the chance to tell you, uh, Andrew, like uh, this is how I know things are going to be pretty good for the show. Uh, like my kids love the hell out of it and I I'm genuinely sad that I didn't think to have my phone out and record them watching the show because if you had seen the delight on their face and as they burst out laughing when uh, I think it was during the bike segment when the guy's like, hey, man, I need my beep bike and stuff or whatever, like like <laughs> like they were genuinely guffawing, you know, pure childhood delight on their face. It was it was amazing. That's awesome. I love to hear that. I love to hear my that. My mom has actually time. been trying to get me on the phone to talk about your show. She's like, when can you have time in your schedule to call me until we can talk about Andrew's show? Because I really who, love Who it. said this? Who is this, Justin? My mom. Oh, your mom's amazing. Gloria Young. Oh, Gloria. We're Facebook friends now, your mom and I. Uh, no, I'll tell you what. You're, uh, the, the, the mothers, Young and Brushwood, are always the first two to comment on any and Don't Trust Andrew Bain related uh, Facebook sharing. It is always in, in whatever order, Gloria Young and Vicky, Vicky Brushwood. Brushwood. Yeah. Uh, it's two out of three, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I noticed that we have, uh, Andrew Zarian in the chat right now. Um, uh, Andrew, uh, thank you so much for having me on. I, I had a, you know what you guys should maybe do Andrew's show. He, um, does a weekly show for the international association of internet broadcasters, the IAIB. And, um, uh, you know, he's right on the edge, you know, he's, he's built his own network and everything, and he's trying to create this platform so that, so that everybody can do what we do. And he talks about different setups, like, like what's cost effective versus if you're more quality minded and so on. It's, um, uh, I really enjoyed it. And, and I always get something out of hanging out with him. And, uh, I think he's a good, he's a good friend to, uh, to, to this show in NSFW. Definitely. We should have him on NSFW again. I agree. Um, all right. Well, um, I love you guys. I love everybody in the chat room. We love you. I'm actually, I got to head out to San Francisco to see Sigler do a book signing at Borderlands Books. Oh, this is what you were promoting on NSFW, right? Yeah, that's this afternoon at three, I believe. It's an early, uh, an early book signing there. And then, uh, I'm going to go hang out with him and A, his, uh, his associate and, uh, yeah. Right and on. And then uh, later, Tom Tomas Marit, who is in San Francisco shooting, uh, shooting Sword, Sword and Laser. Laser episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Had a, uh, had a good time chatting with, uh, with Tom recently as well. Man, mm-hmm. it's, it's so wild. Everything's changing. Uh, and everybody's hustling. Like everything's trying to fix this. Like on the cord killer side of things, uh, somebody, like we're trying to keep up with all of the opportunities and change. Shut up. Did cord killers surpass 2000? That's amazing. Um, the, uh, uh, like somebody, somebody has like a printing shop or whatever. And they sent me like a half dozen cord killers mugs. And dude, that's uh, so rad. Yes. And what I'm just like, I'm just like, it's clear that like everyone's trying to build stuff and it's like, it's really exciting. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Tell you what, this community, they deserve the world. They deserve everything. I mean, like, and they could have like, like a persistent, like, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like, a uh, the mods could throw a straw poll inside the page. I mean, it would be, I mean, cause that's usually a pain in the ass, right? When you say like, oh, we got a straw poll, then you got to throw the link in the chat and then the chat moves really fast right. or you put it up on the screen, but you got to read it and type it. And that's right. just kind of weird. It'd be nice if it were just like right there on the page. Yeah. I don't see you guys keep talking about this. It just sounds technically, it just sounds amazing, but just too, too awesome, but too complicated. It seems like it it could be like a, like, like for this community, like basically like a tennis court or something. Like, like, like if you know when you're going to go live, you're just like, I'm going to be live at that time. That kind of thing. 
Brian, we might as well be talking about eating ice cream on the moon. Okay? It's a pleasant idea. Yes, that would be great. Hmm. All right. I'm just saying. Hmm. Why tease me? Nah. A... Hmm. All hmm. right. So long, beautiful people. All right. Keep See on guys. dreaming. Bye, Justin. Bye, Brian. Bye. Oh, hey, uh, FYI, if you're hearing this on the stream, I uh, I might play some uh, Payday 2 in a couple hours here. We'll see. But I'm going to shut down the stream now. So take care. Die in a fire, jerks.